Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Thank you very much. And um, here we go for the start of a wonderful uh, expo. So I'm going to talk to you about cheetahs and what we're doing to try to help them. And our motto is, you know, saving cheetahs means changing the world. And that's what we're all doing here today. And I know that you'll enjoy meeting everybody. Cheetahs are the most amazing animal on the face of the earth. And then there's the rest of the earth and the rest of the animals. But just look at them. They're the fastest land animal. They are built not only for speed, but for doing a very important job, which is maintaining the health of an ecosystem. They keep all of our grasslands healthy because they help keep all the wildlife healthy. So they weed out the sick and the old and the young and the slow and the dumb. And with that, we have healthier ecosystems. When you have top predators like the cheetah, you not only have this healthy ecosystem, you have much more biodiversity within it. But cheetahs today are actually um, losing uh, their race in many respects. We are in our sixth global extinction, and not to bring gloom and doom, but this is a reality. And if we don't face the reality, then we're not going to actually be able to change the reality. And I want you to know, and today, with all the people here and all of my colleagues working around the world, we can make a difference. We can make this change. Just to think that we might lose 40% of our land mammals by 2050 is not right. And it's not right to our young children. It's not right for us as older people to do this. But unfortunately, our large carnivore populations are, are declining. And cheetahs' problems are here. You've heard me talk about this before. Habitat loss, overgrowth of human populations, human-wildlife conflict, because in Africa, everybody has their livestock. And when there's so many more people, you've got that many more livestock, and then you've got conflict, and then people are poor. Very, 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 very poor. And with that, we have to change that. Another issue we're facing today, which is very critical, and that is our illegal wildlife trade. And I'm going to talk with you more about that more today. But the cheetah um, is an animal that lacks genetic diversity. It actually um, went through a population bottleneck about 10 to 12,000 years ago, leaving it very genetically similar. We've got abnormalities with their reproduction, over 80% abnormal sperm, and all of this is really causing a reduced population. With that, the way to save them is to try to stop the loss of any individual cheetah anywhere. I did grow up uh, loving animals on the back of a horse. I loved dogs. I loved goats. I was a goat um, judge, any of you. Um, and in the early 1970s, I went to Oregon um, to have a winery and my dairy goats there. And with that, I got a job at the Wildlife Safari. And that changed my life. Um, I, growing up, I spent most of my time following behind um, my favorite veterinarians and um, still ride every single day that I can when I'm at home. Thank you, Anne, for your saddle. <laughs> In 1977, uh, I went to Namibia with this cheetah named Kayam, and she changed the face of cheetahs for the rest of the world. My job was to find out if she could learn how to hunt out in the wild. What I found is that farmers were killing cheetahs like flies, eight to 900 a year. And I thought somebody should do something. There's got to be somebody who will, if I tell enough people that people are killing cheetahs, somebody will do something. And over the time, it came back to me. Nobody did anything, so I set up a foundation. And um, in 1990, moved from America to Namibia. And today, we are the largest cheetah conservation organization. We are only a handful of cheetah people. You'll hear Rebecca later on today. We are a very small group of cheetah people working very hard. But we actually set up a whole reserve. We've got about 140,000 acres. We're a model farm. We're open to the public, so we welcome people to come and learn. We're a training center. We do have a lot of orphan cheetahs. These are cubs that have been, mothers have been killed, pet trade happening. These are all at our center in Namibia, where we've got a genetics lab and a veterinary clinic. We do livestock guarding dogs, which are helping save cheetahs. And we have a habitat restoration project. But just again to let you know where cheetahs are, and it's very, very important. In the last 100 years, we've lost over 75% of the range and the numbers of cheetahs throughout. Today, there's less than 7,500 cheetahs throughout their range, and those are in the um, dark orange parts of the map. The light orange is where they were previously. I'm based down here in Namibia. 
Uh, Namibia is about two and a half times the size of California. Between Namibia and Botswana, we have about 50% of the population. And with that, most of the animals are found outside of protected areas. With only 23 countries where there are cheetahs and 31 populations, with 20 of those populations under 100 individuals and understanding their genetic makeup, you can see that this can be a very critical problem. Um, I'm also based up here now in um, Somaliland, where we've just now, a few weeks ago, set up our nonprofit status there. The reason being is that there's illegal wildlife trade, and these cubs are being caught from the Gulf of Africa, uh, and they're the Horn of Africa going into the Gulf, and from that, they are going into the illegal pet trade, where the people up in the Middle East have them as a status symbol. Um, and this is really what we're looking at. Again, I'm based now up in, um, in Somaliland, where there's about 300 within the Horn of Africa. We've got multi markets down here where they're selling bones, and, and, um, and there's a lot of trade there and hides. So these are the issues that we are dealing with. We've had, um, this is the numbers of confiscations, and just in the last, since 2011, we've had almost 100 cats that have come unto us. A week ago, um, as I'm here in the United States, um, we got a call, we got confiscated another um, 12 cheetahs. In a matter of two days when they got to our sanctuary, we have three of those cubs alive right now. And I've, I've got these, one of these fancy watches that go along with stuff. And so I'm on like 24 hours a day figuring out what's going on. One of the cubs right now is not doing all that well. But that just gives you an idea of the kind of tragedy that we're based with. The green areas are where we know there are cheetahs up there. It's very dangerous. You can't really go out and find them out in those areas. But we are now starting to train students up in these areas from Somaliland. And the red is where we're doing the confiscations. Um, we've had to expand and build facilities. Those of you who have been to Namibia, these facilities know, look nothing like what we have there. But this is immediate. We've had to build these in the matter of just a few months. We are doing a lot of training and we're trying to get people on the ground in Somaliland as well as throughout the Horn of Africa to take on this cause. This is a few minutes and I'd like you to watch Barely this. Barely a couple of weeks old, Gollis is clearly in desperate need of his mother. But this orphan cheetah is one of the lucky ones, rescued from the illegal wildlife trade. Across the Horn of Africa, if the mothers aren't killed, the cubs are snatched from them, smuggled in cramped crates and cardboard boxes. By the time they get to this shelter, they're barely alive. According to the Cheetah Conservation Fund, some 300 cubs are smuggled out of this region every year. And for every one that makes it into captivity, another three die on the way. That valley down there is becoming known as the Cheetah Supermarket. That's because many of the trafficked cheetahs are being smuggled across this porous border with Ethiopia into Somaliland. This breakaway state from Somalia is the main transit route for the trafficked cats out of the Horn of Africa, smuggled across the Gulf of Aden to the Arabian Peninsula. The survivors of the rough journey become an exotic accessory, like designer bling as rich Gulf Arabs compete for social media clicks. <laughs> At least a thousand cheetahs are estimated to be in private hands in Gulf states. <laughs> According to experts, most die within a year or two in captivity. Although private ownership and trading of wildlife is banned in most Gulf states, enforcement is lax. Illegal online sales are starting to be policed, but if you really want a cheetah, they're not hard to find. This is an online Saudi marketplace, and when we search for cheetahs, several listings came up, some advertising two to three old cheetahs, others selling young cubs. <laughs> this man in Saudi Arabia is eager to sell. $6,600 U.S. dollars seems to be the starting online price in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi government did not respond to CNN's repeated request for comment. There are only 7,500 cheetahs left worldwide half the number from just a decade ago. P. 
people who have a cheetah as a pet are causing the species to go extinct. It's leading the way towards extinction. Mr. Bottle is one of the favorite toys that we found. American biologist Lori Marker and her cheetah conservation fund are racing to save the species from extinction. This is not how a baby cheetah should be living. Uh, they need to be living out in the wild. They've set up this safe house in Somaliland for the rescues. It's bursting at the seams. Seeing them in here, it breaks my heart. You can see why people call them cats that cry. It's our responsibility to give them the very best care that they can have and to try to save every single one of them. Ten-month-old Kitty is in intensive care, the last survivor of three sisters. She is not one of our healthiest cats, um, and it probably does have a lot to do with where she started in life. Despite the team's efforts, Kitty didn't make it. These animals are a smaller population, a very rare population, and from that, each one of them do carry a different genetic code. This one is a male. Every cub gets microchipped. Their DNA is recorded. Without a mother, they have to be taught how to hunt and survive in the wild. It takes sometimes months to try to get one cheetah to get on its feet. Neju Jimmy, a soon-to-be vet, is their main caregiver. I love them so much, so I, I don't even see my mom once a week. She lives over there. According to Marker, there are only about 300 adults in unprotected areas in the Horn of Africa. If you do your math, the math kind of shows that it's only going to be a matter of a couple years that we're not going to have any cheetahs in this region left. Many have already been lost to conflict with humans. Somaliland wildlife authorities are busting traffickers. It's illegal here, along with private ownership. But in the capital, Hargeisa, a popular restaurant advertises burgers and captive lions pacing in the background for selfies. For three years, this cheetah on a short rope has been the star attraction for paying clients to pet, poke and pose with. The owner insists it's legal. We have a license to, to keep these animals. And plus, this guy, he's, there's only one cheetah here, and he has a lot of space uh, to run around. Why it was tolerated in plain sight went unanswered by the authorities. More are hidden behind walls. Even as we're leaving Somaliland, two more cheetahs have been confiscated from a house here in Hargeisa. Three more were seized just a few days later. As long as there's a demand by the rich, creating a lucrative trade for the poor, the cheetah's future hangs in the balance. Time is not on their side. Well, that's our life these days. Um, and I'm going back to Somaliland in a few days. I just have come from there. This is the new facility that we're building. All these young cubs now are growing. We've got more coming in. Seems like our government in Somaliland is now doing more confiscations. We've got some teeth behind it, but there's still a lot of problems. I've just come back from CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. CITES, um, the Middle Eastern country, said there is no illegal wildlife trade. The Horn of Africa countries know there is, and right now we're trying hard to get this going forward to try to get um, the stopping of this trade in some way. So we're dealing with a lot of um, governments and politics and policies around this. On a happy note, I'm going to try to quickly share with you what's going on in Namibia. Namibia is doing well. We're working very hard. In the last um, few months, we've just increased our farmland by two very important pieces of land. This is now a whole reserve based next to the Greater Waterberg, um, the Waterberg National Park and the Greater Waterberg Landscape. This is our 25th year of our Livestock Guarding Dog Program, if you can believe that, 25 years of WCN as well. And um, over the years, we have uh, bred almost 700 puppies. We've put them out throughout not only Namibia, but many other areas in Africa. And um, we've got about 200 dogs working regularly on farms. And our farmers and our staff are working hard. We see between 70 to 100% reduction in livestock loss by having the dogs, and we've just got Soon, we've gotten one new puppy in, but we've got two more new breeding dogs coming in this year as well. 
We also use dogs to find SCAT, and our SCAT dog program continues to grow. Not only are we working throughout the farms in Namibia, we're also working up in Angola to find SCAT on the carnivore projects there. And uh, much of this we're also publishing and trying to contribute to the science of using SCAT dogs. Once you find the SCAT, we call it black gold, it's poop. It comes into our genetics lab, and there we can identify species, individuals, look at populations, look at the diet, diseases, hormone. So our team is very, very, very busy. This year, we will be putting two master's programs uh, finishing, both um, Brian and Hafeni, who are working on looking at the population of the Maasai Mara cheetahs. So if many of you have been out there, we'll have a whole population pedigree and know who's related to who, and it's quite exciting about that. Um, and our community program also works. We've got, uh, this past year, covered a huge area, about um, 7,000 square kilometers, and within this, we were able to put out camera traps everywhere, and um, this is a very important area that we're working within. We're finding the predators, the prey, but there's not a lot of prey, a lot of livestock, and some predators, and they're killing a lot of the African wild dogs. So we do a lot of training. We work with future farmers of Africa. This year alone, we've worked with about 140 farmers and over um, 15,000 head of livestock. And uh, we also do a lot of training with youth and school groups. We get university groups in. We're working with the University of um, Langston University, which is in Oklahoma, which has the best goat university in the world, <laughs> based in Oklahoma. Um, and yet they're also based throughout Africa. And so they're working with us in Namibia and some of our staff is coming over here. So it's quite exciting. And then school children, already this year we've worked with about 16,000 school children going into schools and having kids come to us. And with this, we've got internships as well. And a lot of the kids come internationally, but also locally. And this year we've already had about 35 interns and over the last nearly 30 years, we've had over 600 interns, and some of those people are actually out here. And um, many of them are, some of them are working for WCM. We've also started a rabies clinic, and um, our veterinarian's been out working on vaccinating of dogs. Um, we've this year vaccinated about 1,000 dogs and cats already, and we're then working this next year to try to develop a, um, a spay and neuter campaign that'll help because in these areas, rabies is a problem, and we really are highlighting the fact that most of the people, their livestock, their dogs and cats are not vaccinated, and it is something that can be deadly to humans as well. We rehabilitated seven cheetahs this year, um, as well as putting six of our um, painted dogs out uh, for rewilding. We've got another nine that are going to go out soon, and we're quite excited about that. And this is our facilities in Namibia. It looks a little bit different than Somaliland. We are off the grid. We do have solar everywhere. Our solar panels were actually donated to us by Tika, which is a Turkish aid organization. Because we raise livestock guarding dogs, they support us because they like the fact that we're working with farmers. This is our battery pack, so we are all off the grid, and we work hard to keep ourselves clean and green along with our, lives, our um, habitat restoration program. Many of you have heard about this because of the overgrazing. We get thick and thorn bushes that grow really high. We harvest them selectively. We're Forest Stewardship Council certified. And from that, we make a fuel log. And just this year, we will be starting to make biomass electricity. And we just got our gasifiers from a guy over in Berkeley that are going to start, and we're going to now be actually linking it up with our solar and having biomass electricity. We welcome interns and volunteers at all of ages. Many of the people here in the room I know have been volunteers with us, and we thank you. And if you don't want to volunteer anymore, you can also come and stay at our little lodge and learn more about what we're doing. We've got a staff of about 130 people. This is some of them uh, from, from last year's Christmas, and we welcome you to come and visit, and we thank you for being a part of the work that we do. You are the cheetah's future, and you've been a very, very dear friends and family to what we are doing in Namibia. Thank you.